All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Mike Dean Podcast. This is going to be episode 98. Uh, we are closing in. We are two episodes away from the milestone 100th episode. Uh, I have a big guest for that. I don't want to say who, but always 30th. It's going to be a very, very a good milestone episode with that. And we have some big guests in the meantime. If you haven't checked out the previous episode, episode 97, I spoke with really one of my favorite writers ever. And the reason I started writing, it was so fun chatting with him, Mike Lupica of the New York Daily News. He joined the show and it was great to have him, a great chat with him. And time honestly just flew by. He was uh, truly, truly fantastic. And episode 98 uh, is someone that is, again, very interesting in his own right. He's not a writer in terms of writing for a newspaper, but he has written a book and I have it right here from Brooklyn to Baghdad. I love it. I can't put it down. And uh, who is he exactly? Well, my next guest is, has spent 20 years with the New York City Police Department. He joined the force in 1986. Uh, originally serving as a cop in Plano, Texas. He'd move his way through the ranks, eventually attaining the rank of sergeant. And after 15 years on the job, his life and career would travel down a new path, as in the aftermath of 9-11. He moved into the NYPD's intelligence division, where he supervised a team of counterterrorism detectives as they sought to protect New York City from further attacks after that day. Retiring in 2006, he would not trade the hustle and bustle of the NYPD for quiet time like most do, instead embarking on a very interesting counterterrorism mission on uh, behalf of the United States government in Iraq, which he will tell us about. And it was chronicled in his book, which again, I have here from Brooklyn to Baghdad, which came out just a few years ago in 2019. Great book. Highly recommend you get it. I'll put the link to it in the description uh, later on as we go. And that is retired NYPD Sergeant Christopher Strom. Welcome, Chris. How are you? Hey, I'm doing great, Mike. Thanks for having me on the show. I appreciate it. Now, I appreciate you being here. So, you know, you talked about your childhood when you were on off the cuff and uh, it wasn't an easy upbringing, you know, and uh, I mean, granted, you were able to push through it and, and, and do some great things. But just take me through what those early years were like. I think you grew up in Garden City, correct? Yeah, I grew up in Garden City. Actually, my grandparents lived there. And um, when my mom and dad got divorced, I ended up living with my my uh, grandfather and grandmother um, and pretty much went through all elementary and middle school uh, living with them. And then um, my mom remarried and uh, it was a disaster. She remarried a, a person that had uh, seven kids of his own. So now combined myself and my two sisters, now there's 10 of us. Uh, and, and unfortunately some, some of the uh, issues that they had growing up kind of like intertwined and kind of, kind of came to a head with us all living together. So that didn't last very long. And then now I'm actually uh, moving back with my grandparents and uh, going through high school. And um, somehow I managed to survive that. And then eventually uh, it got worse, it got better, it got worse. My grandfather had passed away. My grandmother had since passed away several years before that. And um, I was kind of floundering actually in life. And I thought, well, I got to do something because if I don't do something, it, it's, I'm just going to get in trouble. It's only a matter of time. And I ended up joining the Marine Corps. And thank God I did because it saved my life uh, along with my, my grandparents, just, you know, uh, very spiritual, religious people. and you know, giving me a, a good uh, religious foundation and a moral compass and things like that. But, you know, the Marine Corps and the combination of my grandparents, they both saved my life. So um, I'm grateful for that. Shout out to the grandparents, you know, love my grandparents. Uh, I still have my, you know, I was telling this to Lupica when he was on the previous episode. I was blessed to uh, have my great, great parents in my life, which not many people wow. can say. My great grandparent, my great grandfather is still around. He's going to be 85 in November. And, you know, that was just, you know, when things were going rough for me, per, not in, at home necessarily, but in school, I, I'm a survivor of bullying. Uh, that was my safe haven. So grandparents, they're the best. I can they are the best. That. I can they really that are. 100%. And so, you know, take me through, I guess, before we get to your career in law enforcement, just take me through what life in the Marine Corps was like. Well, I tell you, <laughs> if you've ever seen the movie Full Metal Jacket, um, it's uh, it's it's really almost like gives you the chills because it's very much like that. The technical advising that they had for that uh, with uh, uh, Lee Rem Rem Emery, I think is his name. He's since passed away. Um, was phenomenal. It was it was exactly like that. I'm 17 years old. Um, I've really never been on a plane. I've never really experienced life beyond my little bubble. And, uh, you know, for people that aren't familiar with Garden City, it's kind of a Tony town. It's very um, waspy, as they would say. And, um, you know, my experience was, was, was a five mile radius, you know, and I was very sheltered, you know, living with my grandparents initially. So to give you some, some context, um, in the summertime, I went to bed at seven o'clock and I lived on this, my bedroom was on the second story of my grandparents' house. And the kids would be out in the street playing, you know, whatever, uh, kickball, stickball, whatever. 
you know, right and riding their uh, skateboards and roller skates. And I'm sitting there on the windowsill looking out, you know, because my grandparents just said, no, you're going to bed at seven o'clock in the summertime, even though it didn't get dark pretty much until nine o'clock. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's, that's, that's kind of like how it was. And then, um, you know, I get into fast forward, I'm into the, in the Marine Corps and uh, I'm terrified actually. I'm very scared. Um, there were a couple nights where, um, you know, I, I really wish I had uh, made a better decision. And um, I remember as clear as day, standing online, just like in the movie, where are you from? Where are you from? And at that point, I had enough common sense to say I wasn't from New York. I just said I'm from Garden City. I was terrified to even say, I, excuse me, I said from Long Island. I didn't even say New York. And uh, the, the drill instructor just looked at me, says, got up like right in my face and said, well, you're not going to make it, son, like that. So if I wasn't already terrified and, and it was suffering from confidence issues, that really put, put everything into perspective. Um, but I managed to survive it. And then uh, I got out into the Fleet Marine course and I went to a couple of aviation schools and I eventually ended up working on Cobra helicopters um, at MCAS New River, which is in North Carolina. And the uh, Cobra squadron was called HMA uh, 269. So it's a helicopter marine aviation uh, attack. Uh, and they're the, two seaters that are kind of have like a staggered seat. One is above the other, very narrow. And uh, they provide close air support. In fact, they're still in use today. And um, I had a great time and I still have some friends that I keep in contact with that from, from the Marine Corps, which is really a blessing. And um, I think if, if it wasn't for the Marine Corps and the combination of my grandparents, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. I'm, I'm quite confident of that, I'm quite sure of that. We're talking with Christopher Strom here in the Mike Damon Podcast. This is episode 98, Rabbit Hat. Chris here, he's the author of the book From Brooklyn to Baghdad. Um, so that brings us to the beginning of your law enforcement career, which didn't begin in New York, it began out in Plano, Texas. Uh, why Texas in specific? Well, that's a good question. Uh, actually, my uh, dad had relocated there, and um, there was an opportunity to get involved in law enforcement there, which I had wanted to do in the NYPD. And um, I took a test, and I ended up getting hired. And at the time, Plano, Texas, this is back in 1985, was a very small department in relative terms. So I think at, at the time while I was there, it was probably about 140 sworn officers. Um, and now there's probably upwards of 450, 500. It has grown tremendously. And to the point where the town is actually landlocked. When I got there, there were still a lot of like farms and pastures and things like that, you know, where there was ag ag agriculture and farming. And, and um, th but you know, and I'm saying to myself, I was on the midnight shift and a lot of a lot of jobs, you know, consisted of like a burglar alarm or a house alarm, which frequently happened after uh, a thunderstorm or something of that nature. And um, I said to myself, is this all there is? You know, I mean, because I mean, I, I really want to be a cop. And I, you know, listen, if you get if you look at TV shows between Los Angeles and now Chicago and the NYPD, you know, that's where you want to be. And that's what I always you know, kind of fantasized and dreamed about as a, as a small child, you know, and I had an opportunity to come back to New York. Uh, I had already taken the test prior to moving to Texas and uh, my background investigator was kind enough to just reactivate my folder and update it. And I was in the, got sworn in on January, in January of 1987. And uh, from there I did all the things that, you know, you see on TV. Um, I did the patrol, I did anti-crime. I did a robbery unit. Um, I got promoted to sergeant. I did narcotics. And eventually I make it into uh, the intelligence division, which to me was, it was an amazing, they were all amazing experiences, but the intelligence division in particular was a real eye opener for me because uh, up until then I was pretty familiar and pretty, pretty capable in terms of being a street operator, but in the intelligence division kept doing counterterrorism investigations, a lot of nuance, a lot of very smart people, way smarter than me, that actually showed me uh, and mentored me, not the other way around. So I was very grateful for that opportunity. Well, let's dissect some of it um, as we go through the meat and potatoes of your career. I know you mentioned you were in anti-crime for a while. A lot of people really wish that anti-crime would come back as of late with uh, the increase in the violence in the city. Take me through a given night of anti-crime and, and take, me, take me through some of the really uh, notable moments that you had getting some really dangerous weapons and some really dangerous people off the streets? Well, anti-crime is, um, is the one of the most effective tools in terms of deterrence and apprehension of violent street found. So, you know, you're in a plain closed unit, you're in smooth cars. I mean, let's be, let's be honest, you know, 
you're not really fooling too many people. I mean, the car is the same minus the, uh, the fancy graphics and NYPD insignias and things like that. But it does give you a tactical advantage in terms of being able to get a, a, a little bit of a head start on somebody if they're actively involved or maybe in possession of a firearm or things like that. So that was an experience that um, is something that you don't just go into. You, you really have to make your bones and you have to show your street credibility on the patrol side before you get accepted into a unit. That And most precincts at a precinct level I'm speaking about, the sergeant determines who's going in that unit. So one of the key factors, obviously, is arrest activity. If you don't have a good solid arrest, arrest activity, and I'm talking about felony arrests, gun arrests, stolen cars, robberies, and things like that, chances are you're probably not going to get into anti-crime. So I had that already. I had been waiting to, to get into that unit. I had really posted for it and wanted to get in. And when I finally got in it, it was amazing. It was like everything you see on TV. It was just cops and robbers, car chases, dark alleys, you know, sometimes you'd have to be physical with people. And um, it was very, very exciting and very, very rewarding. And so for a while, you mentioned, of course, you were promoted to sergeant, and we'll get to your years in the intelligence division in a moment, but you got the chance to run the Queens robbery unit from 1996 to 2000. And this is during a time when broken windows policing was really at its peak. Uh, even after Bill Bratton had left, the model continued. It wasn't abandoned. It didn't obviously great success was achieved as a result. So running the robbery unit during a time when the NYPD really had carte blanche to do what it needed to do to get crime down and succeeded wonderfully. Take me through what that was like. And also, I guess this is a two-pronged question. You're a sergeant by this point. People look up to you. You're a leader. What does it take to be an effective leader? Well, I, got, I just want to clarify. I was, uh, I was still a cop at the time. Oh, when I was my robbery, So I don't, I don't want to mislead anybody. Um, but I got in there as a result of a shooting that I was involved with. Um, when I was in anti-crime in the 101 precinct. And it was one of these things where um, the person was driving a, st a stolen car, you know, there was a violent struggle and the person got shot as a result of that. And um, for a while, for about 30 days, they had taken me off the street because I had to do a, what they call a firearms investigation and things like that. And once I was cleared of that, they didn't think it was a good idea for me to go back to the 101 precinct. So the chief at the time was this uh, chief by the name of uh, Burke, B-U-R-K-E, and he realized that I was a good cop and that this was just a set of circumstances that shouldn't have prevented me along my career path. And he actually told the actual supervisor of the robbery task force to pick me and put me in. And that's how I ended up getting in there as a result of, of a shooting in the one on one precinct. OK, so that brings us to, I guess, well, before we get to the intelligence division, when we think of the intelligence division of the uh, New York City Police Department, we tend to think of it a little bit differently now after 2001. But by this point, OK, uh, let's get to that day itself, September 11th, 2001. Take me through where you were, what you did and the experiences you had that day. Sure. Well, I was in the 7 6 precinct in Brooklyn, which um, is kind of like the Red Hook, um, Cobble Hill and, um, and I can't remember, and the Gowanus houses. So geographically, it butts up against the East River uh, for people that aren't familiar with Brooklyn. Atlantic Avenue would be like the northernmost border. The East River would be the westernmost border. And then I can't remember the exact cutoff street for the southern border, but it would be pretty much the uh, the uh, Gowanus Expressway. And you had the Red Hook houses and things like that, which has all been totally regentrified and they've taken the piers and built them up into beautiful condominiums and there's a cruise line there. But when I first got there, that wasn't the case. So getting back to your question, I was actually working in the street narcotics enforcement unit and my daughter's birthday was uh, September 11th. So I changed my tour to go in to do a day tour because uh, prior to leaving my house, I told my daughter, you know, wished her happy birthday, and kissed her goodbye and said, you know, when, when daddy gets home, we'll have cake and there'll be presents and grandma and grandpa will be here. And um, so I went into work uh, and picked up one of my detectives, Ginger Velasquez, and we decided let's go get a bite to eat because we really weren't in the rundown and we call it the queue. So basically, um, you know, we responded to calls if somebody needed a backup, but we weren't part of the rundown in terms of being a sector assigned a specific job, if that makes sense. So we went into the diner, we leave the diner and the radio is just is exploding with communication to the point where you really can't understand other than that, the trade center, the trade center. And when you when I walked out of the restaurant, it's actually on the corner of Court Street and Atlantic Avenue. So I'm looking at the World Trade Center and in the Staten Island 
uh, ferry terminal, which is at the southernmost tip of Manhattan. And I see that the building is on fire and the smoke because of the prevailing wind is now drifting toward Brooklyn and bringing all the debris and glass and, 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 and papers and things like that, um, you know, toward the Brooklyn side. And it's actually landing in the streets, almost like confetti, unfortunately. So I parked my car um, and I'm watching it and I made a phone call immediately to my wife and my wife was working in Queens in uh, St. John's Hospital, Episcopal Hospital. And um, are you, I asked her, are you watching the news? She says, yeah, what's going on? I said, I'm not really sure right now, but it, it, you know, it doesn't look good. And with that, the second plane came as I'm on the phone with my wife. And then there's obviously a tremendous explosion. And I said, I gotta go. So from there, I, I redeployed back to the 7-6 precinct. I have a conversation with the desk officer and we're, we're um, deciding where we're gonna go in terms of posting and things like that. So I, I end up going to the uh, battery tunnel and I'm there for about 12 hours. And if you can imagine now, people that aren't familiar with New York City, the battery tunnel takes you to where what would be when you came up on the uh, Manhattan side, right almost smack in front of the World Trade Center. So I'm on the Brooklyn side, the people that have started to go in and also started to come out are now trapped inside the Brooklyn Battery Tunnels to the point where they have to abandon their cars and start walking either toward the World Trade Center or back toward the Brooklyn side. And most of them walk back toward the Brooklyn side because by then they had kind of figured out that there was a, there was a terrorist attack. So the people were walking out almost like a scene from Dawn of the Dead. They're completely encrusted with dust and debris. Um, they, it's almost like their clothes are one uniform color of just ash. And um, we're trying to triage them and get their names. Ambulances are all swarming down on the scene, uh, trying to help the people that are, have respiratory issues and take them to hospitals and things like that. So this cycle continued. I, I, I don't even know. I'm sure it was over 12 hours that I was there, that this was going on. While that's going on, simultaneously, uh, tow truck drivers, unannounced, unasked, decided, hey, can we help you? Can we start removing some of these vehicles from the tunnel so that they could clear a pathway for other emergency vehicles to get into lower Manhattan or to come out? And we're like, yeah, that'd be great. And uh, you know, so that started to happen. And then they started moving some of the cars out to create at least one lane so that people could get, get in and get out. So. That went on for about 12 hours. I finally get reassigned the second day uh, to go to ground zero. And I'm there uh, with my team because now by then everybody has been called back in to work because it's a, a serious emergency, obviously. And I'm there with my narcotics team and we are basically providing some kind of security element um, right down on uh, in Lower Manhattan, right by the entranceway of the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. So at this point, I mean, I, I, you said you were able to get to ground zero the second day. Do you feel in retrospect that maybe, you know, not going down to the trade center before the collapse in, in essence might have saved your life? Well, I don't want to, I don't want to be verbose about it. Listen, you know, God's got a plan. I don't know what God's plan is. God's plan for me that day was to be exactly where I was. I don't argue with that. Um, but it, it, to answer your question more directly, I think if anybody was seen within a 200 foot or five, maybe even a 500 foot radius of the buildings, regardless of what their status was or what, they, what their function was, there's a good chance you wouldn't be, they wouldn't be here today. It was just that incredible of, of a collapse and um, destruction. Uh, of course. And, and last question on that, you know, uh, a lot of uh, personnel was lost that day from a lot of different departments. The New York City Fire Department suffered tremendous losses, as did the Port Authority Police. The NY, New York court officers lost three officers. Uh, the NYPD lost 23. Did you, did you know any of them by chance? No, actually, uh, I didn't know them personally, but a, a crazy story related to what you're asking me. When I worked in the 101 precinct, we had a young guy named Petey Brennan. And uh, yes, Petey Brennan was a, a great guy. Um, he always wanted to be a fireman. And, um, and so much so, and he also wanted to be a bagpiper in the Emerald Society. And uh, he had tested for the fire department and uh, he eventually got picked up by the uh, FDNY and, and he was tragically killed. So I didn't know anybody personally on the police side, 
but I knew someone that was a former police officer that I worked with, um, uh, and a great guy. And uh, unfortunately, he was killed in the World hey, Trade Center. Pete Brennan was a member of Squad 288. Uh, one of the guys that he used to work with actually has been on the show, Hank Malay, and, and Hank spoke very well of him. He was a great fireman by all accounts. Uh, so afterwards, the intelligence division, the purpose, I mean, the purpose was always counterterrorism, but even more so after the events of this day. And you're at the forefront of that. So without giving anything away, obviously, take me through the day-to-day -day intelligence operations post-September 11th. Well, my day usually started at about eight o'clock in the morning in terms of being physically at, at, at the uh, office. So I worked in the, what they call the Brooklyn Army Terminal which is uh, over in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, again, right on the water, uh, actually in a warehouse in a non-disclosed building. And um, my day-to-day -day function was basically what they call leads. So people, because of 9-11 and the proximity of how far we were right of 9-11, um, you could just imagine the calls that we would get. Um, so for example, uh, and I use this a lot as an illustration because it's relatable, you'd have an 80-year-old woman that calls in uh, a complaint and says, you know, I live in an apartment building and um, there's a, there's a, uh, a gentleman by the, by a name of uh, Dave or whatever his name is. He lives next door to me. And it's very strange. He has people coming over every Friday night and they look like they're Middle Eastern men. And, um, and by the way, all the plates on their cars have uh, Jersey plates. So in the criminal side, people would say, well, that's just not something the police would answer. On the counterterrorism and from the intelligence division perspective, we don't get to pick the jobs. In other words, in the intelligence division, I know this might sound like a novel idea to your audience, but not you, Michael. We don't answer jobs from the desk. We don't look at a computer screen to find the bad guy. We actually go out and do some surveillance, do some door knocks, and do some investigation, real police work. And, you know, nine times out of 10, it's just somebody being paranoid. But the 80 year old woman that lives alone in Brooklyn that's lived there for 40 years. She's pretty familiar with the comings and goings and anything that might be unusual, it's worth looking at. And that's how the job would start. So from that, we would start maybe doing some plate checks and we would run some of these individuals. And lo and behold, something would pop up. Now we have a true investigation. So that would be one aspect. The other aspect is a train derailment or an explosion. Well, you know, again, getting back to the patrol side of the NYPD and the criminal side, that doesn't necessarily intrigue me back then. In the intelligence division, you rolled on everything that was like that because you just don't know. So to give, again, some perspective, 5,000 sergeants in the NYPD, four did my job counting me. So the person I worked for was a 36-year CIA guy named David Cohen. He was the former commissioner of, of the intelligence division. And he wanted to know things in real time. He didn't want to hear it on the news. He didn't want to hear it like, well, I think... He wanted you to be at the scene of whatever it was because he wanted to know. He was committed to keeping the city safe. And so that's who I work for. And the people that I work with had that same level of commitment every day. That's what we did. So amongst the jobs that you got as a course of somebody phoning it in or dropping uh, an email or even a hard copy letter, you know, we would we would respond to all those different jobs. But um, it, it, it was just one of those things where you just never knew every day. And depending on where you were geographically, it could be a problem. And again, getting back to Commissioner Cohen, he wanted to know in real time what was going on. Um, and you better have an answer for him. You couldn't just say, I'm in transit and uh, I'll, I'll let you know what's going on. Like, you better be there again. And you have to realize, too, uh, the news media, because of the sensitivity to 9-11, and we weren't that far away from it, they were rolling too. They were listening to the police scanner. So if they got there before you did, meaning me and my team, uh, you'd be replaced because he kind of felt like you weren't competent enough for the job. So I lived with that for, for almost five years and I loved the job and I loved the people I worked with because they were amazing and they made me look like a superstar. But that type of, of stress is, is, uh, is burdensome and it's, it's taxing. It's mentally taxing and physically taxing. And my days typically ended around 10 o'clock at night. So I'm working beyond a 12 hour day. And again, this isn't about boo who feels sorry for me because I was being very, very well compensated. I mean, the job gave me a car and it gave me plenty of overtime. But, you know, when you do that day in and day out and day out, and again, the people make the job. I had great people working with me and for me. 
So it made the job even fun, even with all that stress and aggravation, it was still fun. And as a result, we developed some really serious cases because of this. So, you know, it, I'd like to feel like it wasn't all for not. There was a, the, the level of commitment, the jobs and the, and the amount of threats that we, we put an end to or put a stop to is really a testament to the whole intelligence division, not just me, not just my team, the whole intelligence division working together. Absolutely. And he, uh, for my listeners, you referenced David Cohen. If you want to learn more about David Cohen, David Cohen, as he said, was the uh, deputy commissioner for counterintelligence and counterterrorism. When Ray Kelly returned as police commissioner in January of 2002, four months after the events of September 11th, he brought in David Cohen and they essentially built the NYPD's what is now a world-class counterterrorism operation, essentially from scratch. Um, and so David Cohen is, is a tremendous visionary in that regard. His position was taken over by John Miller, who should really come on this show, by the way. Uh, and hopefully I can get him uh, down the road. So, you know, as, as this proceeds, I do want to ask, and obviously in reading your book and in talking with you and seeing you off the cuff, you took everything very seriously. But um, just in terms of, I mean, listen, we're human. We're, we're, we have these tendencies to think this way sometimes. It can be that when these tips get called in, somebody, not you necessarily, somebody could think, ah, this is probably nothing. It's probably nothing. It's probably overblown. It's nothing called, nothing case, whatever. And might take it at a leisurely pace. But it could be that what you think is nothing turns out to be something. And right. if something catastrophic comes and happens down the road, you got to live with that. And that's a difficult right. thing to live with. So how would you make sure that if somebody appeared to be given off that attitude or even verbalize something like that, you'd figuratively, not literally, smack them back into shape and say, hey, don't think that way. Do the job the way it's supposed to be done. Well, you know, I'm fortunate, Michael, that I, I didn't have people like that. Okay. Um, so I didn't have to really address that. Listen, most people would kill themselves to get into the intelligence division. I'm talking about NYPD officers, whether they were a detective or a supervisor. Um, so it's really, it's really an honor to be part of that, that, that uh, community. And just to give your, your audience some context, um, the NYPD intelligence division, I'm talking about human intelligence, where you actually talk to a real person and put that information into a database, is by far the Google repository of all human intelligence. So where we started at, when you referenced Ray Kelly and Commissioner Cohen, prior to that, the intelligence division and all intelligence services, I'm talking about the FBI and the New York field office, was not anywhere near what it is today. Fast forward, we have an NYPD intelligence officer worldwide. So you could pick a country, you could pick a city, there is an active duty detective and a sergeant, sometimes two of each, depending on the threat level, at every major city in the world. I don't care if it's London, Paris, uh, Spain, Israel, Jordan, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, UAE, Singapore, there is somebody there. And the reason why they're there is because the people that were supposed to be minding the shop back in 93 when the World Trade Center got attacked the first time, and then fast forward to 2001, who thought they were doing a good job, were not doing a good job. So Ray Kelly said, we have to take ownership of this project, and that's exactly what he did. And the people, again, getting back to the people that I work with, amazing, committed people, smart people, really smart people. And they took the job very seriously because we didn't want that to ever happen again. And thankfully, thank God, it has not happened again. There have been close calls and there have been instances. But by and large, the masterminding programs, listen, some of the programs that are involved in the NYPD Intelligence Division, if you really knew, you would fall out of your chair. Some of the things that they do on a daily basis in terms of workload and information that's put in and called from their investigations and actual door knocks and human intelligence is mind blowing. So that database has now, like I said, not only become the repository, it's become the go-to for all human intelligence, whether it's in California, whether it's in Interpol, because we can track these people. They're international. We can track these people and we know. And now if an incident happens say uh, in Paris, France, we have the same uh, apparatus that was, was, was my job. That detective and that sergeant are going directly to that scene and they are reporting in real time on the phone with Commissioner Cohen or Commissioner Kelly or somebody that works in his staff and telling them what's going on. Instead of reading it from a desk or a computer or a news feed, they are right there at the scene. They could see it, smell it, touch it. Right. The first I ever heard of this, my friend Leonard Levitt was uh, on the show a number of years ago. He since passed away. Sadly, he died last year of cancer. Um, 
And when he was on the show, I mean, I remember reading a column from, from him years ago when I was prepping to interview him. And he mentioned that after the tragic Madrid bombings in 2004, there was already two intelligence detectives there relaying information back home about right. what had transpired and gathering information right. to see if it had any correlation to New York. So that's the first inkling I had of it. And to think, I mean, listen, the full scope of it, unlike, like I said before, unless you're in it, uh, the full scope of it, you'll never know. And right. more the history of, of divisions like this are, you know, some of it's known, some of it is secret and probably going to stay that way forever. But right. just the, the mere glimpse of it, um, it is absolutely incredible. I have some photos that you sent me, by the way, and we're talking with Christopher Strom here in the Mike Newton podcast, and I didn't want to let this podcast ba- pass without showing them. Um, of course, one of them is, is from Ground Zero, I believe. And if you could just explain the context behind the photos, I'll show along the way. Uh, okay. But first, we'll start off with this one. Hang on a second. Did I share the screen properly? There we go. There you can see it. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, so that's me. Um, like I was describing the second day, um, I, I, I want to say that's on Liberty Street, uh, and um, I'm there with my team. And as you can see, everything is completely covered in ash. There's, it's, and there are trucks that are trying to remove debris, and there's cherry pickers, and they brought in a, actually a crane from Ohio. They had floated it down. Uh, I don't know if it was there that day when they, when they took this picture. And um, the crane was actually picking up the steel and loading it into these carts, and then the car, these cart trucks we're actually driving over to the um, uh, the East River, and they were offloading it onto barges. And then it's, it was just like a cycle of, of trucks going round and round all day long, 24-7. And uh, there'll be more photos that I'll be showing uh, as we go here on the show. Uh, so I'll fast forward. Technically, your last day, as you explain in the book, and I don't want to spoil the book, obviously, so I'll just say that his last day was in 2007 because you built up enough uh, over time and, and, and uh, days off to uh, be able to, to take those days and, and use them at the end of your career. But as far as leaving, you know, every fireman I've had on the show, every cop I've had on the show, they say, you know, you'll know when it's time. So for you, when did you know, yeah, it's, it's time to transition to a different stage of life? Well, you know, it was a combination of things. First of all, it was very emotional. Like I wasn't leaving because I hated the job or I hated the people. In fact, it was quite the opposite. I, I really loved the people I was working with. In fact, I still keep in touch with them uh, to this day. And we, we see each other. We make an effort to see each other um, at least once or twice a year for a big sit down dinner and things like that. So but for me, I had an opportunity to relocate to Virginia and my kids were still young enough where I thought the transition wouldn't be that big of a deal for them. Uh, to, you know, go into school that, you know, I had my one son, he was, I think he was just going into first grade and my, my daughter was in second or third grade. So it wasn't that traumatic. And I decided I'm going to, I'm going to do it because I was leaving like on a high note, really, honestly. I mean, I, I was, I love the people I was with that had the big going away party. I got the plaque and the gold ring and everything. So I kind of knew like if I stayed a little bit longer, because there were some other things that were going on behind the scenes um, with other people from different intelligence communities. I, I'll let you use your imagination on that. Were, that were really problematic. Um, and it, it became almost like, um, I wouldn't say animosity, but they were, they were, it was trying, mentally trying, some of the things that were being done behind the scenes, uh, not, not on the NYPD side. And it was a very competitive environment. And some of the things that would, I'll, I'll just give you an example. We would get a case. Uh, my guys would get the case, would come through the queue. And just so people have an understanding, it, all counterterrorism investigations come through what they call the JTT at the Joint Terrorism Task Force. So it's that's a composite of FBI, NYPD, Marshal Service, Secret Service, uh, Alphabet Soup. All those people work there at like 26 Federal Plaza in downtown Manhattan. And the job would come over and they would have the first right of refusal. So they would say, this isn't sexy enough for us. They would pass on the job. So I would get it. Now, this is separate and apart from the jobs that are in progress where something's unfolding in real time. That, that we just rolled on, everybody did. And we would start it and, you know, like I said, nine times out of 10, maybe eight times out of 10, it wasn't much of anything, but we still, still did our due diligence. But the two times or the one times out of 10, it, it did have a nexus to terrorism. And we ran with it and we started an investigation and we did surveillance. 
And then lo and behold, I would get a phone call from somebody and they would say, hey, you know, we've got a parallel investigation going on and we have two people in common as your main subjects in this investigation. We're going to take primacy on this case. And they would take the case away from me. Now, again, I, I'm a supervisor, so I'm, I'm fine with that if that's what you really want to do. But that's kind of like dirty pool. That's what we call that, dirty pool. And at the end of the day, I don't need to be standing next, next, to, next to the FBI agent or whoever it was, the Marshal Service or Secret Service, to get my picture taken. I'm more than happy to give that, that light and that moment to somebody else. And what I'm talking about is my detectives that work this case. But that doesn't seem to happen. That doesn't seem to translate. It becomes the me show and a check the box show. And that was not a daily occurrence, but it happened often enough that getting back to your question, it kind of persuaded me to say, I'm leaving on a high note. I'm well respected. I have great uh, feelings and emotion for these people. And they had it for me. And you could go into work and have a bad day. And if you have a bad day, now you're not leaving on a high note. Now you're leaving on a low note. And I didn't want that to happen. So the combination of family first and then career second, that was that was my decision. That was how I, I kind of approached it. Remind me to ask you a question, by the way, about somebody who worked at 26 Federal Plaza, who you may or may not know off the air. I'll ask it when we get off the air at the end of the show. Sure. Um, so in regards to, I guess, you know, and last note on the intelligence division before we get over to your work in Iraq, um, it's at my, our mutual friend, Bill Ryan, who retired out of the arson explosion squad. He told me this and it's a great line. And Billy, when you listen, I'm, I'm going to steal another one of your lines, my friend, <laughs> in which, you know, he, he was telling me in a conversation we were having that it's not so much the, in his case, bombings being in the A&E squad. It's not so much the bombings you get or will translate it to cases you get. It's it's what you prevent really, uh, right. in terms of, of gathering the information. And the Counterterrorism Bureau is, in, and this is just my secondhand knowledge of it, it's so expansive in that the intelligence division, obviously counterterrorism, the bomb squad, arson and explosion, all of it to where, yeah, have we had incidents? Uh, yes, there was a Chelsea bombing. There was the um, attempted pipe bombing in the subway in 2017. Of course, the unfortunate truck attack that killed eight. But have we had anything large scale since that horrible day in 2001? No, and that's testament to the great work that's being done uh, day in and day out. And so, Agreed. Agreed. I, yeah, like, I, like I said, I won't spoil what's in the book, but the move to Virginia, as we were kind of talking about, it was, it was a little bit difficult for reasons that weren't your fault. It's just, uh, if you read Chris's book, you'll read why. And so you were recruited for this mission that would take you overseas. And it's a difficult mission. I mean, the, the cause is, is worthwhile. You don't want the people that are doing bad things over there to come over here and do those same bad things and utilize their weapons of destruction. So just first, it, without spoiling your book, the recruitment process, and then just making the decision and coming upon the decision to say, you know what, I'm going to go. Well, it's funny that we're having this conversation now, because if you look at what's going on in Afghanistan, it's uh, it's kind of like a cycle, unfortunately. And um, I'm not going to get off, off topic, but to answer your question, I was watching what was going on in Iraq for a long time. I was in the intelligence division when the when the first bombs dropped, when they did the invasion and then subsequently, what was happening was it wasn't becoming a shooting war anymore in Iraq. It was becoming a bomb, uh, you know, um, IED, improvised explosive device type of war. It, and that was the primary killer of the soldiers. There were still some small arms fires and skirmishes here and there, but that was the main killer. That in the Iranian uh, EFP, which is an explosive form projectile. Um, and again, for your audience, that people that don't know what an EFP is, uh, it's it's a bomb that starts out concave and becomes convex. And it's launched from a variety of different mechanisms. Uh, and I'm not gonna get too technical, but suffice it to say the vehicles that you see, including a, a tank, uh, an M1 Abrams tank, it's going in one side and coming out the other. So the panacea of being in an up armored vehicle and all this, you know, having a gun turret and all this uh, Gucci gear to kind of like look for these things. At the end of the day, if somebody pushes a button and it's a hardwired device, it's, it's impossible to defeat. It really is impossible to defeat. And if it's timed right and it hits the right part of the vehicle with, where the soldiers are in, pretty much you could rest assured everybody's gonna die that's inside the vehicle, unfortunately. So getting back to your question, I'm watching this going on and I'm becoming increasingly frustrated. And um, I ended up applying for a job and I ended up getting called by a guy that was a program manager who worked directly with Jaeda, which is the joint Improvised Explosive Device Defeat Organization. I know that's a mouthful. And the military loves an acronym. It's, you know, it's just, 
how they operate. And um, he describes the job to me. And initially I was gonna just be like an advisor at a battalion level to some colonel or lieutenant colonel of how to kind of look at this as a, as a criminal organization. Well, it went from that to, I'm actually in the orientation process. I'm fast forwarding, I get recruited and they grab me and a couple other people from the room and they say, we got another assignment for you and we want to know if you'd be interested in it. And now basically I'm going to be an interrogator at the point of capture of Al Qaeda insurgents. And based on what they would tell me, we would build an Intel picture and round up the rest of the cell members. So Bill will tell you, and I will tell you, and you've kind of alluded to it initially, the idea is to prevention. So they call it in the military terms, left of boom, meaning before the explosion, right of boom is after, after, after the event and trying to kind of like forensically put together how this happened and who were the key players and things like that. So they decided to develop this counterinsurgency program called the Phoenix team. And I was a member of the team. There was many members of the team, but my part specifically was we would identify a target. We would roll action the target. And my job was to interrogate this guy in a bathroom to find out who he was and who his friends were in terms of the cell. And the effectiveness of the team speaks for itself. I mean, we went to 30 day consecutive periods without a single IED event, explosion, injury, or fatality in our area of operation. It was incredible. And it became the gold standard and is now part of the standard army training doctrine of how to conduct counterinsurgency operations, which prior to that, they were using things like ground penetrating radar and they were doing dismounted patrols and walking around looking for garbage along the side of the street. I mean, things that were very inherently dangerous and not very well thought out of. We'll, we'll get right now, because this is an interesting question I want to ask. You were doing a lot of interrogation, as you just mentioned. And, and as you explained this, I'll show one of the photos that you sent me of, uh, of capture. And that let's just say, OK, because there's something called capture shock, I believe it's called that, that we'll discuss momentarily. Let's say, OK, uh, you get me in there and I'm a bad guy. And granted, I would give it up right away. I, you wouldn't even be able to introduce yourself before I start confessing because I'm a horrible liar and I'm a scaredy, <laughs> I'm a scaredy cat. I'm sergeant. OK, I did it. Um, you know, but. In a, in a situation where, let's say, I'm a hardened terrorist, and you have me, and you've stared down some stone-cold killers, as you describe in your book, and you have me in that room, take me through the anatomy of interrogation to get me to tell uh, what it is that I'm involved in and what it is that I know. And as you do that, as I said, I'll share one of the photos you sent. Well, first and, first and foremost, uh, the adrenaline rush and the level of fear uh, that you're experiencing, and I'm talking about myself. And the, and the rest of the team is is off the chart. I mean, like if you, everybody is, can relate like the experience of, of seeing a, like a search warrant where because of the shows that we have like live PD and cops and things like that, where people break down the door and they go in there and it's very chaotic and there's a lot of yelling and screaming, get on the ground and things like that. So that, that was happening uh, on a regular basis. That was not something that happened once in a while. That pretty much happened on every mission that we went to. And there was a reason for that, which I'm not going to get technically involved in. But that part was part of the, the organic army that we supported. That was their job. Once the house was secure, you'd go in there. There could be five, six, seven people. And it could be 50-50. It could be four or five women, four or five men, adult men, young men, all different ages. So based on the targeting package, you might just have a silhouette. You may not have even a name. He might only have a nickname, depending on who this person is. He may, which is not uncommon. So your job now is to try and determine who is this guy. And I'm just going to use the word, the name Ali, because that's most common in, 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 a, in a Middle East, Middle Eastern name for an Arab male. And you need to find Ali. Well, you do process of elimination. Now, going back, this is back in 2008. Even then, it was very taboo and very off limits to even talk to women, let alone bring them into a bathroom with a, an American male and ask them questions. So the women are pretty much off limits. We're not talking to the women. So that leaves you with the three or four Arab males. Well, based upon some of the information in the intelligence package, it might be five pages, it might be 50 pages. So I would know that before I got out there. But in the cases where it's just a silhouette, I have to get what they call positive identification first. I have to know who Ali is. Is Ali the 40 year old man or is he the 17 year old kid? I don't really know yet. So 
some of the things that I would do was obviously ask them their name. How long have you lived here? Um, is your name Ali? No, my name's not Ali. Is there an Ali that lives here? But, you know, a lot of times they would lie and say, no, there's no Ali that lives here. So while that's going on simultaneously, the rest of my teammates are, and the Army is searching this house and they're doing what they call sensitive site exploitation, which is a fancy word for searching a house. And they're looking for physical evidence that either shows me that there is a fellow by the name of Ali in the house or something that's related to either an explosive device or financing or uh, components that are used to assemble a bomb. So every now and then somebody would go and they would knock on the bathroom door and say, hey, Chris. So, and they knew not to knock on the door unless they had something that was either very important to tell me in a safety nature, maybe the cordon was collapsing outside or they had a piece of physical evidence they thought would be helpful in terms of me being able to exploit this guy and break him. And every now and then the guy would say, no, you know, I'm just using this as an example. My name's not Ali. I would get a passport. Wow, that looks like you. It says Ali. That's not you. And so you you chip away at their story. And then from there, maybe other things are found that shows his criminality or his involvement in the insurgency. And you keep going from that. Fast forward. If I can genu generate voluntary compliance from this guy, this guy Ali. I would say to them, listen, you seem like a nice guy. This is a famous line in the NYPD. It's been done a million times. Good guy, bad guy, shift the responsibility and onus onto somebody else. And I would say, hey, you seem like a nice guy. You got wrapped up in something. You really tell, I don't want you. I want, I want the real guys. I want the bad guys. And again, the, the effectiveness of the team, the searching, the interrogation, um, and the willingness of the army and the units that we that we supported to flex to another target. I've gone to as many as four different targets in one night based on what each person told me along the way. Not knocking the army, going back to pre-Phoenix team, the army's biggest challenge was getting positive ID. So if they found the passport that said Ali and they put it next to him and they said, yep, this is Ali, we're happy, we're leaving. There was no house searching, the house searching stopped, they just wanted to leave. And I don't blame them because you're asking an army soldier to do what traditional law enforcement does. And I had been doing it for over 20 years. So the expectation of both criminal like investigations and searching and things like that, interrogation, um, you know, is you would expect that if somebody does anything, no matter what it is for 20 years, you generally get better, you don't get worse. But you have 19 and 20 and 21 year old kids that are expected to do this prior to the Phoenix team and their results were not as good as what ours was obviously. And then once this thing took hold, I mean, we were, we were off to the race. So we crushed these people. I'm, I, I am not exagger exaggerating. We rounded up 91 tier one targets, which are the same targets that the special forces community went to, which also caused problems in the special forces community. Because now it's like, how are these 40 year old men and this, this combat brigade team called 122 TST led by this guy, Sergeant Dave Peluso, how is it that a combat brigade level uh, infantry unit is rounding up tier one and tier two targets, targets that were previously identified and on the plate for actioning for six months. How is this possible? And again, it's the genius of the team, not just my, what I did, everybody. We had an intelligence officer by the name of Matt Pacino. He was bar none, one of the smartest people I ever met, big picture guy. And he could see something once and put all these pieces together and he would know the whole network. And he just made everybody's job super easy. And it made it fun. It actually made it very fun and exciting. And the soldiers that we supported, getting back to this, this uh, unit, 122TST, they were like the superstars of the base. They're like the cops coming in with a big gun collar or a big robbery collar. And they are super popular because that word gets out. That word gets out. Like these guys are, and now they feel good about themselves, which in turn, you know, I'm 48 years old, 49 years old at the time this is going on. The level of satisfaction and gratification to see them, the excitement in them and see how they felt good about themselves is an experience I'll never, I'll never get back again in my life, ever. Uh, you know, I, and, and this is a question that I, I, I've asked of a lot of people say, working in intelligence and obviously actually being there, boots on the ground. Sometimes we just have the natural tendency to view things through our own prism. You know, if you live in France, you see things through where you live in France and that prism of it. If you live in America, you see things through an American prism. Even within this country, I don't see things the same way a lifelong Connecticut resident 
than I do as someone who's lived their entire life in Huntsville, Alabama, just as an example. So to actually be there, sometimes the way it might be portrayed on television is not actually how it is. And to see these communities, did it change whatever previous interpretation or idea that you had of the land being there? Well, I, I think a lot of what you see is really how it is. I think in terms of, I'm gonna compare and contrast. Iraq, um, prior to the fall of Saddam Hussein, they're a very educated uh, uh, Middle Eastern country. They have higher education, a lot of engineers, a lot of uh, doctors and things like that. So you have an education system, albeit Saddam was a, was a murderous thug, but the education system in terms of the Sunni and Shia, even though they hated each other, they coexisted on some level, not perfect, obviously. You look at Afghanistan, it's, it's, they're in the Stone Ages. There's really not like a, a modern uh, infrastructure there in relative terms compared to Iraq. So that existed. They wanted that. The Iraqis wanted that. I don't know what's going on in Afghanistan. I'm not a political science major. I didn't go to Georgetown. But I think overall, the response that we got from a lot of the Iraqi people, in particular, the Sunnis, because they weren't the ones that are really giving us the problems, was very favorable. And I thought it was a great experience. Was I going to change the world? Was my team going to change the world? Was it, was a Western culture going to take hold in Iraq? No, uh, I wasn't that you know idealistic and 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 in, th in my thinking, but I just felt good about the work that we did. And in terms of serving uh, serving the soldiers and saving lives, I felt really good about. It. And everybody on the team felt really good about. It. And again, it's kind of like at a precinct level. If you go back to the NYPD, if your crime stats are low. And, and, and you can show the metrics, you know, where they were and where they were after they implemented the anti-crime team, which we were talking about earlier. It's not an accident, okay? You may have displaced the crime and they may, may have moved on to a different precinct or a different part of New York City proper, but you're doing a good job and it's, it's being noticed and it's, it's, it can be demonstrated through metrics and data. And one thing that I do want to also touch on, and I'm having a great time, we're chatting with Christopher Strom here on episode 98 of the Mike Green podcast. Nice enough for Chris to join us here as the author of the book, From Brooklyn to Baghdad, which I have right here, and I love reading. Um, reading the book so far, your wife was then and is now an absolute like rock. She, shout out to her, she held it down while you were away. And it's not easy because, listen, I mean, now I'm bigger, I'm, I'm 21, and my older sister's 27. But, you know, it's it's not as easy when the kids are smaller and you're away for a long time. And obviously you want to be there. And I'm sure they understand why you're away. But still, as far as the emotional tug of war that you have of being away from your family, how does one not even in a military setting, just being away, period. Sometimes people have work in the business world and they're away for a long time. How does one deal with that? I got I got to tell you, you got to stay busy. You can't you can't sit around and uh, and dwell on it. Um, thankfully, you know, because of the operational tempo that we had with the team, I mean, there were times we went out two times a day. I mean, that's just how busy. And it's primarily based upon whether or not they could develop a target or could we track the target. A lot of time in the gym. I like to stay in the gym. You know, um, I like to stay physically fit, physically active. And I'd have my members of my team, we'd be like gym buddies. So they said, let's go to the gym. You know, we have some downtime. So you have to stay busy in terms of something to, to have an out release of, of all the stress and things like that. Uh, and certainly the mental challenge of working with the team and actually, you know, accomplishing some goals that you set out for yourself. I think that's a healthy distraction too, but in terms of emotional pull and tug, like if I sat there and, and really thought about my kids or if my wife could get them on the phone, I mean, that was, it was, it was, it's, I can't even explain to you. It's really a very, very hard emo emotional. And listen, it's not unique to me. It's not, you know, uh, Chris Drum is the only one that's experienced this. I, clearly anyone that serves in the military, like you said, business people, nobody really wants to be away from their kids. Not if you love your kids and I love my kids. Um, but it's uh, something that if you stay busy and you stay focused, it's okay. It's, it, it's, it's bearable. It's bearable. 15 months is a long time. It's yes, it really is. long time. And a lot can change in that, in that time span. So let's go through some more photos here. I know you're in one of these photos, of course. Well, duh, that's why I'm showing. I, I say the dumbest thing sometimes, forgive me. <laughs> but this, this particular photo uh, here, you're uh, left here. And who are the other guys in this photo? Well, uh, the guy on the, on the top right, is, uh, his name is Adoni Paletica. 
and uh, he ran the team. So he's a special forces operator and um, great guy. I speak to him all the time, every week, usually on the weekends we get together and we'll, we'll uh, shoot the breeze and things like that. Um, the guy to his right was uh, one of our interpreters. Um, the guy on the far, on the um, uh, further down, further down the line um, was one of our explosive ordnance detection people. And then the other guys were members of the actual 122 TST. So there's a combination of that and some actually the ones with the um, uh, black vests on and um, and the uh, neck, neck chief are actually some of them are, are Iraqi soldiers that we supported from time to time. We would do joint operations with them. But I'm holding the flag, um, which we always went out. Somebody always held the flag, not necessarily me, but somebody from the team, they would say, hey, you're the flag holder. And on this particular mission, this was my 100th mission with the team. And uh, they knew that. And my friend Adoni knew that. And he said, hey, why don't you carry the flag? So that's actually an honor to carry the flag when you go out there on an operation. And um, I, all, as you know, Chris, I have my mini series within this podcast in which I interview retired members of the bomb squad. And they're going to love this photo. <laughs> why yeah. don't you explain what this is? Sure. Well, that's a cell phone activated um trigger device for an IED. So um, typically, you know, you have all different kinds of methodologies of detonation for an IED. And again, the IED is the improvised explosive device. That's basically a bomb. And it could be, it could be made from unexploded ordnance. It could be, like I said, an Iranian EFP, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of the same. And it could be cell phone generated or activated. It could be um, infrared. So if you break a beam, and the infrared picks it up, they put it on a time delay so that it, it counts and, it, and it, it kind of factors in the speed of the vehicle so that it could be more effective. So this is what they call a plug and play uh, detonator for the actual explosive device. Let's see what the next photo is and uh, what is, what's happening here. Okay, well, that's, that's what they call an RG33. And this was an actual uh, event that we rolled on. Again, it's funny, we had both direct action targeting, and then we had what they call PBA, post-blast assessment. So this was one of these things where an IED event had actually happened. And this was actually probably about a mile and a half, two miles from the gate of our base, very close on Route Jackson. And um, when I got there, the vehicle was still actually on fire. This device was triggered by a 14-year-old kid um, with a cell phone, and luckily, for the soldiers, uh, they all survived. He detonated it too soon. So it hit the engine block of the vehicle, but it's still the whole, you, you, you can't see it from this picture. The whole inside of the vehicle is completely incinerated. But all of the soldiers involved in this actually survived, thank God. So this is kind of an anomaly. Had it been another second further down the road or a half a second down the road, things would have been quite different. And, and folks, I just threw that right at him, rapid fire. He explained each one like that, you know. I, so he's he's sharp, as you can see. This is this is uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is the sharpness of an interrogator. So you came back for a while, and then you know you came back home to decompress, and and you went back. And not a lot of people would go back. I wouldn't even I wouldn't even go over there for fifteen seconds. So to actually go back a second time, uh, you know, as and I'm sure it gets talked about in your book, and, and of course, I, like I said, I don't want to spoil anything. Um, it, there was, I'm sure there was no hesitation on your part, but as far as telling your family, Hey, I got to go away again to do, to go on this mission. Um, it's a difficult sell. So take me through, I guess, that process of it. Well, you know, I, I like you mentioned before, I have a great wife. Uh, we're married 27 years. So, uh, very supportive, um, has never given me any kind of static about anything. Um, and you know, she basically said, this is what you do. This is what you love to do. In terms of the team, uh, I know this might sound crazy, but I missed the team and I was concerned for the team. And I just felt like I want to be there. I want to be there. And I kind of felt like I, I haven't completed. I haven't, you know, I, if the team had all, all left together, then that would be one thing. But the team was still there operating. And I wanted to get back there as soon as possible. And um, I came home for a couple of weeks and I got back on a flight and I flew back over there got right back with the team and we were, you know, right back in the mix of everything. And um, I, again, you become like an adrenaline junkie. It really is. It's, it's, it's an addiction. It really becomes, it's very, anything else is very, other than the level of satisfaction you get with your kids and your family, the level of satisfaction and enjoyment is really second. 
you know, this is a very close second to all of that. So, and, and it's hard to just say no. It's like police work. You, you leave the police department, especially if you're a street guy, and you think, oh, you know, but you look at everybody, you watch their mannerisms, you look at their body language, you look at the, the physicality and look for oddities and things like that. So you, you can't just like stop doing it. I mean, as much as you'd like to. Um, and it's, it's funny, I'll just share with you a funny story. Please. Getting back to my wife and my kids, whenever we go to a restaurant, you know, my kids were little at the time, they don't do it anymore, but they would be little, they would take, they would try and take the seat. It almost became like a game that faced the entranceway of the, of the restaurant. So my wife, you know, she's Italian. She would look at them and she'd go like that. And they would just instinctually know that they have to move. They're like, you know, your father has to sit there. You can't sit there, okay? Because I would never, even to this day, and it's even worse now when you go out with a bunch of your buddies that are all cops. It's like everybody's fighting for the pole position so they can see the door. And it's like, you know, and we're, you know, I'm retired since 2007. I mean, so it never really leaves you. I mean, you kind of tamp it down quite a bit. Obviously, I'm not at that level of, uh, of readiness anymore. I'm not going to claim that, but it just never leaves you. So you're always constantly looking at people and thinking about things and running scenarios through your head. Unfortunately, I can't help it. Even at church, I look at people. Is it a new face? Why is somebody coming in 15 minutes after the service starts? Like I, I look, I'm never going to stop looking. I just keep looking. I can't help it. That, tra- that training's ingrained in you. you never, as you right. said, it never, it never really leaves you. But that's a good thing. I mean, listen, Mark talked about it. That you know, riding on a train, for example, somebody's acting wacky on a train. What do you do? The normal person, you look away. You won't, you don't even want that person to know you exist if you could help it. But you know, coming from that background, you stare right at them because you know. I mean, it just right. that that aspect of it's ingrained in you. And so, there's a lot of people that uh, we hear about their stories and. It's often gets said, how many times does it get said? You could write a book about this guy. You can make a movie about this guy. You actually wrote a book. So <laughs> with, in writing from Brooklyn to Baghdad and NYPD intelligence cop fights terror in Iraq, uh, take me through the decision to write a book. And of course, you know, the process to write a book. It's not easy, but obviously the result of it has been amazing. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate that, Michael. Um, first and foremost, uh, I started writing basically as a way, you know, we're talking about how do you stay focused and how do you stop thinking about your children? So I basically started writing from day one of training when I got accepted for this job. And then I backtracked a little bit and I incorporated some things and some memories obviously of 9-11 and, and, um, and, and my police experience. But I stayed on top of it because I knew it was happening so fast and so rapidly that there was no way that I could keep up with it if I didn't do it contemporaneously after the mission. Because one mission, they kind of like kind of bleed over there's so many similarities and parallels. The names change and obviously the locations, but a lot of the methodology and things change, especially if you're tracking a cell. A lot of stuff sometimes could be repetitive. But to answer you more directly, I must have had over a thousand pages in my initial manuscript. And I was knocking on doors and I was uh, pitching myself to literary agents. And for people that don't know, and again, I'm far from an expert. I'm gonna be very clear about that too. I didn't know anything about the publishing business. I just thought that I had a story that might be worthwhile to tell. And anyone that writes thinks the same thing. You know, it's it's a passion. You could be writing about woodworking or you could be writing about, you know, like um, uh, sailing or riding a motorcycle, anything. If it's your passion, you feel that way about it. And I felt passionate about this. And I thought the experience was worth talking about. And I really wanted to talk about the soldiers. Uh, I didn't want this to be the me show, although a lot of it is based upon my experience and firsthand account, but I wanted to talk and also shed a light on the soldiers, how amazing they are and the things that they do in terms of everyday, you know, unrecognizable things because of what's going on over there. So I'm, I'm pitching people, I'm writing letters, I'm making phone calls. I'm not getting, I'm not getting anywhere. Uh, and then what ends up happening is uh, I was with a writer who, and I'm not going to mention his name. He's actually a pretty famous writer and things didn't work out. And I don't even get a phone call after working with him for two years, I get a text message or an email. And uh, he says, you know, we've decided to move on. It was him and another person. So I'm sitting in my reclining chair in my living room and my son comes home from school. And I, I, I'm not sure how old my son was, but I think it's safe to say he was probably about 10 years old at the time. And I'm feeling sorry for myself because I'm like, I'm, I went from like, oh, it's going to happen to like, it's not going to happen after hundreds of emails and phone calls and things like that. And my son like comes up to me and says, hey, dad, you know what? And my wife had kind of clued him in, you know, your dad's upset, things didn't work out, whatever. And my son says, you know, you can't quit. 
He goes, you, you told me Stroms can't quit. Two, two things in life, people that don't quit, Marines and the Stroms. This is my son at 10. He's telling me this, I swear, I'm not making any of this up. And he was right. He was 100% right. So fast forward, I don't know how close it was to that conversation. I did what I always do. I made a few phone calls and I cold called Jim DeFelice, who wrote American Sniper, uh, a very famous, gifted writer. Um, and I call and I get a lady on the phone. I'm like, oh, a real voice. Sometimes you don't even get a voice. Right. You get an answering machine, you leave a message. And my expectation at that point, nobody's, nobody's going to call me back. Right. That's and, why with the podcast, that's what I go through. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, you understand. So you know, you get a, you get a hundred no's before you get a yes or whatever. In my case, it was it was probably close to five hundred no's, or I'm not even returning your phone call or email. Uh, so anyway, I get this very lovely woman on the phone. And I introduce myself and I said, "Hey, I got the story, and I don't want. I had learned from experience. Don't talk too much. Talk for like a minute, if that, just so they kind of get the essence of it." And I said, "I'd like you know, I'd like to share the story with uh, Mr. DeFelice if he's available." She said, well, um, I'll give him the message. So I'm, at this point, I'm a little bit jaded. And I said to her, I said, ma'am, I don't want you to take this the wrong way. But is Mr. DeFelice actually going to get this message? She goes, oh, he's absolutely going to get this message because I'm his wife. When he comes home for dinner, I'm going to give him this message. So I'm like, oh, my God. So I, I almost insulted Jim DeFelice's wife by being that forward in terms of asking her. And sure enough, two days later, he called me. And it was on Saturday. That much I remember and we talked for about 45 minutes and he says, man, that's a great story. He goes, I'm so busy with another project. He goes, give me some time. He goes, you need somebody to write this story. It's a great story He goes, I promise you I'll get back to you. And from the time I had that conversation with Mr. Jim DeFelice to the time the book became a physical piece of work product and in, in real pages was over three years. So I'm saying all that because people that want to write a book uh, and there's like, and I'm just going to use this as a parallel. If you've ever watched like American Idol or America's Got Talent and you see somebody that comes out there and does a performance, whether it's singing or a magic act or what, whatever, whatever it is, acrobatics and things like that. And you say to yourself, where has this person been all their life that they're so amazing that no one has yet discovered them? I got discovered going back by accident, but also because of that conversation I had with my son about making a phone call, phone call and a cold call to Mr. Jim DeFelice. Because if you have something that you're passionate about, if you have a story you want to tell, you can't, you can't give up. You just have to keep pushing until you get the right person to listen to you. And thank God that that right person happened to be Jim DeFelice. Because if I, if I didn't have that conversation with him, I don't know how much longer I was going to go on at this point, Michael. I really, I really don't. I don't know. Understandably. Understandably to where... You know, like I said, I, I, I on a much lesser level, I go through the same thing when I'm making the cold calls and you say who you are, you leave your number to call back. But in your head, you're thinking and mind you, this is somebody look at look at the career and the resume that you have. And then there's me. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm 21 years old. Nobody knows who the heck I am to make a call and say, hey, I'm so and so. Give me a call back. That's why when people call me back and as you probably experience this, too, and they say, yeah, I'll do it. You're like, are you serious? Are you sober? <laughs> you know, it's, are you sure? But it's, right, it's a very, right. it's a very rewarding feeling. So I guess, listen, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you, you know, this, this, this book has had a lot of success. It's a great book. Uh, do you see yourself writing something else in the future? I, you know, people ask me that. And the, the short answer is possibly, I have another story that I'd like to tell. Um, but I don't know if I, if I'm ready for that. Um, I, you know, this, the book came out in 2019. And, you know, again, if I haven't said it already, thank you very much for having me on your show. No problem. I appreciate it because this is how the word gets out about the book. And hopefully, you know, people, again, it's it's become a domino effect. I've done shows and then uh, somebody will email me and say, hey, I'd like you to come on the show. And I'm, I, 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 I don't know if there's ever been a time that I said no. Um, and, and I've been very blessed to be on Newsmax a couple of times and things like that, too. So it, the word is getting out. And I, I'm hopeful that somebody is going to hear this. The right person is going to hear this kind of like getting back to America's Got Talent and, and American Idol and things like that. That piques their interest that I have a, a different conversation about this book and it goes in another direction. But again, it's all part of God's plan. I, I You could have the best laid out plans. And you know this. I mean, you, I know you're good, I know you're a great guy and you reference your grandparents. So I don't I don't have to imagine what your grandparents are like. I know because I live with my grandparents. They're special people and things just happen. 
You just have you you think that you're you know driving the, the the ship, but things just happen. And I I'm I'm of the belief that something is going to happen, whether it's a year from now or five years from now. I think something will happen. But when that'll be, I don't know. But writing a second book, I would love to write a second book. And I'm other actually under obligation from my publisher, which is Chicago Review Press, to give them first writer refusal if I write a second book. So we'll see. We'll see. Uh, this has been Christopher Strong here on the Mike Newman Podcast, episode 98. I want to get to the concluding segment now of this podcast. And this has been, you know, much like my last episode of Mike Lupica, the time has really flown by. I mean, we've been talking for a while and it doesn't feel like it's been a while. It's It's been great talking with you. So what this segment is called is rapid fire. It's five hit and run questions for me and five answers for me. Are you ready? Okay, I'll try. All right. And you can say pass if you want to. First, okay. if not for policing and or, you know, the Marine Corps as well, what other career could you have seen yourself pursuing and enjoying? Uh, definitely construction, something something working with my hands, whether um, finished work, like fine work, woodwork. Um, I actually have my A license to do construction and I enjoy it. It's something, again, when you build something and then you see the uh, see how it makes other people happy, that they like what you did. That's that's a level of satisfaction that I appreciate. It makes me feel good. So definitely construction or cabinetry, it's something like that. Absolutely. Second, you've been living uh, down in Virginia for a while. So thing you miss most about New York City. Oh my God. <laughs> Definitely the food. Definitely the food. I mean, I, listen, there's a lot of nice restaurants down here, but, um, and I, you know, it's more of a relationship type of thing. When I go there and, you know, I get to see my friends or family from, from New York and we're in a restaurant in particular, or even, even at someone's a family member's home and it's a home cooked meal. Um, my wife's Italian and my whole side of my wife's family is Italian. Um, I miss the cooking. I miss I miss that quite a bit in New York. Yeah, the cuisine is the best. Uh, third, funniest colleague you ever worked with? Funniest colleague, geez, there's been a couple. You can um, say most. I'd have I'd have to say uh, this guy named Timmy O'Flaherty. Um, we got along great. He we, he and I worked in the robbery task force together. His father was a cop. I knew his family uh, intimately. We're very close. Um, I retired in, in 2007. I think he ended up going from New York City as a detective, moving out into uh, the Southamptons to be a, a sheriff. And um, but when we were in a car, we laughed all day long. I mean, because and then not because of me. I don't think I was particularly funny, but my friend Timmy O'Flaherty had such an offbeat sense of humor <clears throat> that um, there was never we were never like, oh, this job stinks. You know, I can't wait to get out of here. When's looking at our watch? What time is it? Nothing like that. We just had a lot of fun every day. Absolutely. Fourth, best advice anyone ever gave you? Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to say the Marine Corps. I wouldn't say it was in, implicit in terms of don't quit, but they showed me how to not quit. So um, that's been ingrained in me. When people say no, I just laugh at them or it can't be done. I really do. And I mean, I get there as fast as other people. And I don't think I'm the smartest person in the room, but I think I'm smart enough to recognize that. But I think persistence and never giving up and never quitting um, is probably the best thing that was imparted to me from the Marine Corps. And again, recognized by my son, reinforced by my son. So. I had the same experiences with this. I mean, sometimes you get told no and, and you just keep pushing. And, you know, when your work gets recognized and I'm able to chat with people like you, it reminds me, you know, of just exactly that. Keep pushing and, and hopefully some doors open. So fifth and finally, you know, the job is, is a dangerous job. It's a difficult job. And a lot has happened the last year. To any young cop coming on the job now with your experience, what advice would you give? Them? Wow, that's a tough question, Michael. I, I, I don't know, man. I, I, first of all, the NYPD has so many things that you can do. I mean, if you want to be a detective, if you want to be like Bill Ryan, a, a arson explosive guy, if you want to fly helicopters or pilot a boat, scuba, there's so many things. So my advice in terms of picking the department, again, obviously I'm partial to the NYPD because I love the NYPD and I love the guys and girls in the NYPD. And I think they're the law enforcement in general are the best people in the world and the military also, obviously. But if they're going to pick a career in law enforcement, I, my suggestion would be to pick a bigger department versus a small department. And the reason why I say that is if you pick a smaller department, it might take you 10 or 15 years to get the position that you really want. You're kind of limited. Usually somebody has to retire or get promoted for you to move into that spot. In the NYPD, there's heavy duty turnover. There's always people getting promoted and there's always people retiring. So 
your ability to laterally transfer into some of these specialty units is a lot more is a lot more reasonable than some of these other uh, smaller departments. And that concludes what's been a wonderful episode of the Mike Daniel Podcast, episode 98. Uh, Christopher Shaw, retired NYPD sergeant. The book is, as you can see here on the screen, for those of you that are watching this on YouTube, Brooklyn to Baghdad and NYPD intelligence cop fights terror in Iraq. I can't thank you enough for coming on. Before we go, uh, if you have any shout outs you want to give besides the book, of course, which I'll link in the description of this video, any shout outs you want to give, fire away. Hey, yeah, listen, anyone, thank you again, Michael, so much for having me on the show. I, I, I greatly appreciate it. Anyone that wants to connect with me uh, on social media, it's, it's Christopher Strom. Um, if they're interested in looking at any, any other videos or interviews, that's how they can find me. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. Uh, I'm on Twitter, but not that much. I kind of stay away from tr- Twitter. I'm more of a monitor of Twitter and, admi- and an admirer from a distance. Um, it's but, the safest um, way to be. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and if they Google my name, they can they can find me. And I, and I very much appreciate you uh, plugging a book for me. Thank you. Hey, no problem, no problem. Uh, it's a great book and, and hopefully, you know, if more people can buy it and I have it here and I love it. So on my end, if you're listening for the first time because you're here for Chris, stick around. I'd love to have you. The YouTube channel is MC's Audio, MC apostrophe S Audio where you can get the video version of this podcast, audio version of the podcast, Apple, Spotify, Spreaker, wherever you get your podcast. We're there too, where you can get uh, the audio version. Of course, on Twitter, I'm Mike in New Haven. If you want to follow me there on Instagram, I'm original underscore MC1. Or if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, just type in Mike Cologne and then MIC apostrophe D because there's a lot of different Mike Colognes out there. But if you type in MIC apostrophe D, you'll get me, of course, for the Mike the New Haven podcast. And if you want to ring me up, if you have any sports-related inquiries for the podcast, um, the business line for that is 917-727-0891, or you can email me, Cologne on sports, C-O-L-O-N on sports at gmail.com for all the sports-related guests that we do on the show as well. Any other inquiries that you may have, law enforcement, fire service, news, you can ring me up at 917-781-6189, or you can email me, Cologne Report, T-H-E, C-O-L-O-N Report.com, or C-O-L-O-N Report at gmail.com. Excuse me. Coming up on the Mike Canadian podcast, he once uh, defused a bomb that was strapped to a live suicide bomber in 1990, and he did not have any of the gear to do it. His, his name is Kevin Berry. He's retired NYPD bomb squad detective first grade. He served for 34 years in the NYPD from 1968 until 2002. And for episode 99 next week, he'll join me for what will be volume 12 of Tales from the Boom Room, profiles of the NYPD's bomb squad. And for the 100th episode, August 30th, I don't want to say who it is yet, but let's just say she's one of the more recognizable faces in news. So that's going to be a milestone episode, and I'm very much looking forward to saying who it is in the coming days. In the meantime, on behalf of retired NYPD Sergeant and author Christopher Strom, much love, guys. Thanks for stopping by and listening. As always, we will see you next time. Take care.